Hello and welcome to the Smite Draft League Playoffs. More round one action for you. We've got the Tactical Feeders versus Volcanic Lightning. I'm Anthony Malum. He is King Fisher. Let's get into picks and bands. Yeah, get into them indeed. And uh, becoming more of a trend, two bands that we've seen a lot lately. And I think for good reason, the Ishtar, she's simply one of the best gods in the game right now. It's a top pick, top band god. We talk about it, it seems like every set. On the flip side, Suzano and Lancelot, also two insanely popular junglers right now. We continue to see jungler really just the focus of all these premier or er, challenger teams. Yeah, it's. It's becoming a very common theme, and I can't really blame them. <laughs> I mean, that's where the game is won and lost a lot of the time. I, I'd say jungle and ADC, especially in Challenger, have been incredibly impactful. And I I don't know. My my biggest fear, and we've seen this a few times, is when you... And we do see an Ishtar ban, but when you ban out jungle like that, you leave other roles and other characters open that could potentially be the problem. Yeah, and I think one role, for me at least, or I guess two that always come to mind, are mid and solo. I mean, solo bands feel more like target bands every single time. I mean, picks like the Guan Yu are consistently let through, and I think one of the most undervalued gods right now. And then mid lane, there's just no mids right now that are top three ban worthy, and it's letting a lot of these mid laners get away with picks that normally they shouldn't be allowed to have. But I think you're right, all the focus on jungle and ADC really just can bring to fruition how undervalued some of the picks are that they squeak through these phases. For sure, and another thing I'm interested to see is we know that um, there has been a lot of roster changes here for tactical feeders, and they're running out a basically a new team in terms of feel and with, with Evan and Chris Pocket. So I'm excited to see what that brings to playoffs for them because... You know, making those last second roster changes with the playoffs around the corner is not an easy choice to make. And it's it's scary in terms of cohesion and team composition, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, it definitely should. And I think uh, Evan probably more so than any member of this team makes such a huge difference. Not only his mechanical skill, but you see time and time again on picks like the Cupid and the Cernanos. He really gets ahead. The Rama too, I think a pick we've identified can kind of run things from the duo lane. But the comms and the play calling cannot be undervalued. I used to team with him, and it is just Chris. He knows exactly when to go for all objectives. So we've really seen really few misplays from the tactical feeders in the past few weeks. But now, one of those bands we were talking about being let through, the Scylla. It's a really strong mid-pick, and one that is still not really seeing the respect bands. Yeah, I, I'm kind of surprised on it. Maybe... Maybe this is going to have to be a, a semifinals thing to wait for, but the amount of Scyllas we've seen has been telling, and she's been strong everywhere she's been picked up. So it's nothing to mess around with, and it's it's sneaking through a lot. It definitely is, and I love it going on to this Volcanic Lightning team. I think it's Black Air Forces in the mid lane. The one time we've seen him on Scylla in the past, or at least the one I can recall, hit the resets like crazy. Not a lot of Scyllas in this league that can really consistently and reliably get two to three ults off per fight. Definitely one of them. This Cernanos pick, as much as I love the god, it worries me a little bit into this Hades. I think that's definitely going to be a Hades solo, and that is going to be really hard ult to get out of from the Cern. Those beads are going to be being burned on cooldown. For sure, and I also always worry about Cernanos into a ROM. I, I, I feel like I'm a broken record on ROM. It's almost like I play the character a lot, but I feel like he just does so well into characters like Cernanos and Ho Yi and on her characters that really need to position themselves in front of you for their best types of damage, as well as their dash is a fundamental part of their kit because he can kind of at least... If not limited, he can stall it and make you wary of his crippling arrow. And ultimate-wise, I feel like Rama is also very well matched for a certain to be able to survive temporarily. It definitely is, and I think one of the few interactions, Cernanos, a god that wants to almost be melee range in some fights to get off that passive damage with the heavy glaive, and Rama really easily can roll backwards, cripple the Cern, and keep the distance, which on a hunter like Rama, you want to keep your distance, it's a hunter that revolves all around hitting autos from pretty far away, and any chance you can get to do that in a fight is definitely the right move. Now a couple interesting bands coming off the board, a Baba Yaga and a Horus. 
Not something I've expected. We have seen Kakolin and Ganesh bands pretty frequently in the past, though. Yeah, I... Those feel slightly in target band territory. I I will say it does feel like so far, I mean, granted there's only six characters picked total, we are seeing our favorite thing, which is we're seeing comfort valued over meta. I mean, obviously there there can be combinations, but it feels like we're these guys are playing characters who we've seen them prioritize all season. Yeah, and talk about another combination of comfort and meta. If the Geb is locked in, I have been getting horribly baited all playoffs with people hovering picks and then switching them up. But I think another <laughs> support that kind of like some others we've identified just isn't seeing a lot of respect in the ban phase. I'm not too sure why. I mean, the CC immunity into the dodgy is going to be really nice. It's a very telegraphed CC. It's easy to communicate with your team. So if this is going to be a Geb lock-in, should find massive value with that. The Cataclysm too. The Blink, Geb into Cataclysm, it's going to happen a lot faster than a lot of these gods can get their CC immunity off. Dodgy needs time to get into the Pillar. Cernanos has one, so this Geb, or the Optimus Prime rather, should be finding a ton of value. Yeah, you make a really good point about Geb, and what makes what that brings my brain to is I think about a lot of supports throughout competitive Smite, be it the old school roars to the Jeff Hindlas to the current day Neomaz and such it where they prioritize in more stressful competitive settings the focus is less on the long term and winning game by game and winning sets the focus becomes on what can you do in that singular game what can you play and put your focus on to keep everybody alive and I think that is where Geb is going to excel he definitely should and I love the Oh gosh, a frontline lock-ins here that we're seeing from Volcanic Lightning. I know I talk a lot about liking really traditional tanky frontlines, and you got two of those, Cthulhu into the solo lane and Atlas and support. They all have a really good amount of utility. They are beyond tanky. That's going to be a really hard line to crack for the tactical feeders. It is. It's going to be a challenge, but that's really what we're here to see in the challenger league <laughs> as we do wait for the final pick to come out I, I i will say i feel like advantage is currently pick and ban wise i'm gonna go volcanic lightning but i'm i think tactical feeders could pull something out especially with double adc so with that being said we'll meet you in game number one of the set We've got more playoff action. We have Volcanic Lightning in blue, and Tactical Feeders is sporting the red trunks. I'm Anthony Malum. He's King Fisher. Let's do it. Yeah, and already, I think I think you mentioned at the tail end how you liked the Volcanic Lightning draft more, and I think I gotta agree. I normally do love seeing double ADC comps. I think this is a team that can pull it off really well. That being said, I don't love the Hades pick. With these, obviously, going to be building full damage to kind of offset for lacking a mage. But they're not going to be the healthiest team in the world, especially, I mean, Geb, really going to have to pull dividends for this team. Going to have to be on point with the stone shields and really inserting themselves into a lot of these fights to find good value. I agree for sure. Daji peeking around solo, but just going for the totem, nothing too crazy. It's... Uh, it's there's always the the route where double ADC can go crazy and c carry a team to victory, but there's always the f the the dangerous side of it where it doesn't go that way, and double ADC finds themselves caught out very harshly. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a real big risk reward kind of thing, and if they are able to get off to an early Ooh. lead, there is very little that can stop it. Robin comes over, not going to be successful on the gank. 
King of Darkness just gonna chill and get back up in the tower. Not too much kill pressure there onto the Atlas. That Interceptor gotta help kind of peeling them off, helping on the minions too. It was very close. The Astral Strikes were almost enough to pick up the kill with the slow, but they weren't quite there at the end. And we find ourselves still at 0-0. I've been very impressed by the maturity and the calmness of these games from Challenger. They feel more like Premier games lately than they do Challenger games, as we saw at the beginning of the season. I know, gotta, gotta wonder where it was the whole season, but I think, like <laughs> I said, a, a, a lot better discipline. I think not only that, just pacing, these teams are realizing, like, hey, it can go to 40 minutes or whatever, and we can still win. There's no need to get it done in the first 15 minutes. And I love seeing that style of play. I think it makes a lot more sense because it's attempted buff invade, but it's not going to work. Yeah, it might have been slightly too late on the invade, but showing the pressure sometimes is enough to benefit your team immensely. A lot of damage on King of Darkness in the dual lane, but it looks like they're safe for now, and the, the calmness is continued. Yeah, and I think one big question mark for me early, Ooh, looking close. at this Hades build, normally we see them building into a Typhon's Fang or a Bancroft Claw in the first two slots. I think normally that's what we've seen with the Hades solo. I don't know what book they're going to go. I would guess maybe Polynomicon to get some of that same lifesteal online. I don't think Book of Thoth is too popular for Hades solo. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I'm... Hmm. I'm kind of curious if there's... No, there's not really any other route he could take. I, I, I have to agree. I would have liked to see the other route. But in terms of doing damage, the damage will be there and we'll be doing some some numbers, to say the least. Definitely will. I think this is also one of the first times that we've seen two magical matching up in the solo lane. And also interesting to see Cthulhu started for the book build as well, so maybe I'm just out of the loop. I think typically in these playoffs in, in the last few weeks, we've seen Pythagoras piece be a really, really popular item with the Cthulhu solo. And now both ADCs remarkably even. I think Cernos has a lot more early pressure, so the Rama definitely gonna have to be careful, especially with Atlas coming back into lane. Yeah, I... I love me a good support ADC boxing matchups. It's one of my favorite things about the early laning phase of Smite. It feels like the most action-packed lane consistently. Sometimes mid lane can be up there, but you just can't beat the support ADC dance of who's trying to do more. Interesting positioning from Volcanic Lightning. It looks like they're waiting to make a play to defend the mannequin, but couldn't quite get much off of it. As now Chris Pockets here, Polymorph comes out and does not work out for Chris Pocket. Now the attention goes to King of Darkness, and they poke him out and get him away, but they can't get quite more than that. I'm sure they wanted much more than that in that play. Yeah, and that's a really good use of the Wild Hunt, dispelling most aggression there. The Robin jumped over it, but still going to be enough to force him off of the Cernos. Five minutes in, without a first kill, like you said, I think we've been seeing a lot more patient games out in Challenger lately, a lot more pace that we like, but I'm still used to seeing really, really early first bloods. I think definitely a benefit to both these teams that they haven't dropped that yet. Normally, already see blows flying by the time Gold Fury spawns. Yeah, it, it's... Oh, nice dash to avoid the rollout. It's always... um. It's always weird to see how these teams kind of flesh out and feel out the early game to see the routes they want to take and what they want to do. I do admittedly feel like sometimes that can kind of play to your non-advantage. Uh, it almost feels like it slows things down too much. Yeah, it definitely can feel like that, but I think I'm still stuck on the team comps a little bit. When you look at this double ADC on the side of Tactical Feeders, and especially the fact that they both look like they're heading towards a crit route, obviously still a lot of time to switch up that build. Do you like seeing the double ADC in this meta? I know it used to be really popular when the build was kind of the pen and ability-based hunters. That's where we saw a lot of double ADC comps. Do you like it as much in the crit meta, or are you not a fan? I I actually do. I, I I personally love the most what it brings to objective secure more than anything else. And then how you how you push late in the game on towers and phoenixes and the structure damage you can put out. I do think it has its downsides, but overall I like seeing it. I do kind of miss out on a, a strong mid lane, but with going Hades here, I could I could be swayed to liking Tactical Features Draft more, but I am sticking with my guns and liking the Volcanic Lightning Draft. But to answer your overall question, I, I do like me at double ADC. 
Yeah, it, it's, it definitely has a lot of benefits and drawback, and I think normally the key to that we see is getting off to an early lead. So if tactical feeders are able to do that, you can kind of just snowball your way to the rest of the win. That was mistaken. We are going to see two Book of Thoths, three overall if you count the Scylla, instead of the Polynomicon. So Hades giving up a little lifesteal early, something I have never seen from that god. Yeah, I I mean, damage could be there, but Polymorph comes out after the follow-up on the route, but the Purification Beats is enough for Evan to get away. Very close call there for Rama. It looked like the Kernanos is feeling himself, and some pressure coming out in mid, but Chris Pocket really was just showing up more than anything else. Yeah, and Chris Pocket's really been all over the map this game, and that was a really good use of the ult by Perspective Duck to get the Rama beads and force them away. I think the Cernanos ultimate is a lot less valuable than the Rama ult, and especially beads, so anytime you make that trade, you gotta be happy. Now Cube is coming in. Volcanic Lightning, they have a 3 on 2 here as a Robin's heading over to the red buff. Do you think we see an attempted buff invade here from Volcanic? You have to assume, because there there comes a point where you are just being too passive, and you gotta start trying to make plays happen. Budweiser Cranker a bit low under tower, but no no aggression from Patro, like I may have thought there might have been. But yeah, you gotta make something happen at some point. Uh, there is a purple invade from Cubed, but he could not get it. Gev Ultimate comes out, Cube falling low. We have our first kill, Chris Pocket makes it so. First blood for tactical feeders. Yeah, and finally, the kink is going to pay off. Seems like he's already tried it a hundred times. Chris Pocket finally finds value in forcing the beads out of Cernanos 2. Really good big play for the Rama. That sure to swing early pressure over to Tactical Feeders as they now look for this Gold Fury. They are on a roll right now. It's a questionable call, but I, I don't hate it. They're burning it quick, too. Black Air Force is just now spotting it out, working its way over. Does have the I'm a Monster available, but has to get in there to use it. Setting up for it. Here's the Yama Monster. They let it go. Very smart play. Now Volcanic Lightning's on it, but the Medusa damage is good. I'm a monster, no good. They reset it again. Tactical Feeders cleans up the Gold Fury with the help of Black Air Forces. Yeah, and that was really well played by both teams, I thought. Even though Volcanic Lightning lost at Gold Fury, they did exactly what they needed to, showed up at the right time, got into the Oh gosh, I'm a monster early. But on the flip side, Tactical Feeders, they drop it right away. You can tell they were just waiting for that Scylla to show up and help them to their goal a little bit. Really smart play from Tactical Feeders is now go up about 2,000 gold. Yeah, and that's uh, when a game is this calm and this passive, 2,000 gold is a pretty significant early lead to get. Yeah, it definitely is, especially when we're not seeing a ton of big plays to really turn that lead around and i think for my other teams despite being 2000 gold up tactical feeders they've not gone for a lot of aggressive plays i think we've only seen one buff invade onto the purple it's really just better farming i think overall despite all the levels being the same easily the most even game i think we've seen this season yeah i i'm kind of wondering what's going to be the thing that breaks the camel's back here between these two teams if it's going to be an ADC difference, if it's going to be the, where the solo laners come into play. Cube looking for a gank on to Patra, who's aggressing on to Budweiser. They're here. Katie's ultimate comes out, though, doing a lot of damage. Pow Wow comes out. Reinforcements on the way. This is going to make a turn. Tactical feeders show up in the nick of time, and Nishi gets a kill. Pow Wow gets his own, and it's two kills for tactical feeders and what should have been an easy kill for Volcanic Lightning. Yeah, really good counter rotation there from the tactical feeders showing up at the right place at the right time. It's a hard thing to do, especially in the playoffs. And none of these teams are pushovers. The Pyromancer should fall unless Atlas finds a steal. Going to be a little bit too late on the confirm, though. And the Gold League grows to three and a half thousand off of a double yeah, kill with Pyro. Quick. That is a great swing for the feeders. The objective play has been kind of crazy. We, we, we were both concerned about the Gold Fury call. The Pyromancer call there was clean, but everything's clicking right now in terms of the the calls. I, I Tactical Feeders comms are crisp right now. They definitely are. And I mean, that was a one minute, 2000 gold, two kill swing. Not something you see often, especially given the way this game pace is going. 
But I think that being said, yeah, definitely looking a lot cleaner right now. I think late game though, Volcanic Lightning have a lot to turn that around. They have Cthulhu, who's just incredible in any confined fight, like in the jungle. And the Scylla, they can easily steal those objectives away if Black Air Forces is able to time it correctly. Tactical Feeders has very, very deep wards. I'm not sure if you saw that as well. I, I I feel like that's playing into the objective control pretty significantly as they just have they have full knowledge, they have full control, they have the pace underway right now. The only thing that I can really point to and say it's positive right now for Volcanic is that duo lane, there's no difference yet, really. Yeah, not normally something I'm used to seeing out of the Tactical Feeders duo lane, but Perspective Duck, even a level up on the Rama, despite the rest of his team maybe struggling a little across the map, definitely a ray of hope is now finding massive damage onto the Rama. Rotation in the Medusa, though, means Cernno's going to have to back off. Wow, that was almost a really nice kill. Yeah, that was really impressive rotation, though, for power. It was almost like he sensed the problem. Now, big damage comes out. Black Air Forces gets caught in Medusa's gaze. and gets stunned out and has to use the Sentinel to get away. Going to be safe, but it was a close call in the jungle. Cube runs into power, but as we talked about in other games, that Medusa dash goes across the lane, and you cannot catch up to it no matter how hard you may try. Yeah, definitely can't. Luckily, didn't try to teleport to Medusa and get pulled under the tower. So they rotate to find Rama, but too late. Rama got back to base. Now three members from Volcanic Lightning, not necessarily out of position, but just nothing to find. I think this is a game where even though Tactical Feeders have the lead, they're kind of stalled right now. They haven't been mm -hmm. finding any huge advantages in teamfights. I think all their kills have come from really good individual plays or ganks. It's kind of at a stage where they can't really start pushing the towers, but there's no neutral objectives up. They're kind of stuck in limbo here until the next Gold Fury appears. Yeah, it's always a really tough position to be in as we do have a Blake come out for Chris Pocket. I'm a monster comes out, but it doesn't make a difference. Chris Pocket cleans up Black Air Forces. That was, I mean, you have to use I'm a monster there, but that was a tough break regardless. Yeah, and especially going down just right before the Gold Fury shows up. We saw Tactical Feeders get aggressive with it last time. They're going to do the same, and especially with that Scylla being down, I think this is a good call. They're going to burn it quick, and it's only a Primal Fury. If you lose it, it's not the end of the world, and you can turn around and team fight. Chris Pocket is dropping low on the back. Blink in from Budweiser, Descent comes out, Tactical Feeders cleans up the Primal Fury. Now Budweiser Cranker finds himself a little bit two out in front and has to back up and nobody will go in behind him probably the best call and that's a free fury but as you said primal is not the end of the world certainly definitely not and i like seeing the discipline there from tactical feeders i think most teams both premier and challenger they get that fury kill and they just feel great they feel aggressive i think smart not pushing volcanic lightning back into their jungle i mean they probably would have won the fight i don't think any of would have any of them would have died but without minions being close really no benefit they could have found off it so now they get to go back get their buffs and maybe set themselves up for a good pitch in a minute here and i'd expect them to be on that pyro again they've been really smart with objectives this game with how they've been with objectives with how they've been with map control the ward coverage the gold lead i think the key right now for tactical feeders is keep your foot pressed down on the gas pedal and the key for Volcanic might start to become, so find some way to slow things down and get some control back. Yeah, definitely. Tactical feeders are playing this at their pace right now. Volcanic Lightning can't keep letting them do that. I think it, the game might be deceptive for them. They probably don't feel like they're far behind, but 5,000 gold at 15 minutes, that's a pretty big amount. They're definitely, I think maybe not map control wise, but definitely gold-wise, they are behind in this game. It's going to be a hard one to turn around if tactical feeders keep playing the way they are. Yeah, I have to agree. We do see Chris Pocket a bit deep in the jungle looking to see who they can find. They find King of Darkness. Big damage coming out quickly. King of Darkness falling fast. There's a Medusa ult just to make sure they secure it. It's a killing spree for Chris Pocket. And a tough break there for Volcanic Lightning. Now down 0-5. Looking to make a play happen. Was cued, but he fell low. Now Budweiser Cranker is in descent into madness and very caught out. Chris Pocket runs him down and cleans up the kill on the Cthulhu. Now 6 nothing in favor of the feeders. And now they're pulling Pyro 
They cannot be slowed down right now. They can. That was unfortunate for Volcanic Lightning. You gotta think that is a really big miscommunication there. I like the aggression from Budweiser going in there. They're all like about half health. I don't think it's a bad move at all, but oh. Lulu can Evan find the snipes? No, he can't. Nope. Just out of range. Tough break for Evan, but that will give him some time in duo. And now with the re-engage coming from Perspective Duck, you would think, yeah, Evan's going to be more than safe as Cube walked over one of those deep wards we've been really hammering on this game. And those wards for, for tactical feeders are kind of being the backbone of the whole operation. Yep, and ladies and gentlemen, if you did not know, that's why you ward. I hate doing it in casual, but this ain't casual. <laughs> it's playoffs. Time to get serious. But I think going back to my last point, I think, like I said, I like the aggression from Budweiser. I don't think it was a bad engage, but the entire team backed off. You have to be on the same page to make those calls. Perspective Duck now in more trouble than he realizes. Now going to see the gab and knows he needs to get out of there. Did some good damage to Evan, but now turns to the camp, which will leave him open to the gank from Nishi. Beads come out, not going to make much of a difference. Dash is clean, but not clean enough. Evan picks up the kill on the Perspective Duck. Just unfortunate positioning from Perspective Duck and going for the camp there kind of sealed the deal. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I don't mind going for the camp. Like, hey, get a little bit of extra XP. I mean, he, he, he was dead there either way. Yeah. You're not going to take the ROM out when Geb has a stone Might have looked for up. lifesteal. Yeah, and, and I think not a big fan of using the beads there. Granted, though, Rama was very low. He was pretty close to killing Evan. But at the end of the day, the Cernos is going to fall, and no rotation from Volcanic Lightning means their tier 2 falls. And Patrocles with the solo kill. I guess that's why Hades builds full damage. I am shocked, but level 18 to level 15, going that full damage build with the Polynomicon, it's, I, I see how it happened, and wow. <laughs> yeah, I gotta point out, he did build the Polynomicon eventually, so I'm not completely wrong. Going into a pretty big book build here, I think everybody knows my distaste for powerful solos. I think Hades is the one exception to that. Building Hades tanky, it just doesn't feel good. I mean, he has so much lifesteal that he's already hard enough to kill. Oh. And this is why double ADC pays off. A fire giant call with three members at 18 minutes, it is it's no free. sweat. Yeah, I don't think Volcanic Lightning even knew. It's completely free. Tactical feeders, once again, showing they know everything all the time. And they can't be stopped right now. Yeah, uh, definitely hard to stop a team that's this on point with all their calls so far. I really don't think they made a bad one, and the KD line reflects that. Volcanic Lightning, they have had zero opportunities. That being said, Perspective Duck, he's finding a lot of damage as a Cernanos, keeping Evan Lee Kid in check, which normally a lot of these games we've seen tactical feeders kind of get ahead, and Snowball, it's because their ADC is making big big plays so big credit to perspective duck definitely keeping his team in it by doing so well over there in duo okay lightning playing very far back basically conceding their towers with the gain of the fire giant for feeders which having to concede your towers when the highest level on your team is level 17 and that's a significant lead is never a good feeling and a very bad spot to be in yeah i think all the XP lead is over to Tactical Feeders. That being said, though, I think the later this game goes, a two-level advantage isn't going to be as impactful as it would on some other far. picks. He is very far. But I think Cthulhu and Dodgy still do pretty well when they're under-leveled, so they definitely still got a chance, and now they're finally going to show face on a Tier 2. I like this call. I think they could have done it sooner, though. I don't think Tactical Feeders are going to be too mad if they can't break this big blink from Robert. Big blink from Chris Pocket in the back. Air Forces fell low. He's down. King of Darkness is going to fall to Patro. Rama Ultimate came out, put some damage on Cubed. He has to back up. Now Budweiser's in deep. Descent into Madness does no good. It's a double kill for Chris Pocket. Good news is Perspective Duck cleaned the support camp and is now backing for the Phoenix defense. But Tactical Feeders is running it down. They're at the Phoenix now. And both surviving members of volcanic lightning can just sit back and watch oh i if this Are, is the end call, they're going for the end call as fish just said it's gutsy but they're going for it they blow up cubed and it looks like it's gonna be 
easy sailing from here on out. It's going to come down to Perspective Duck, King of Darkness, and Black Air Forces, and Titan is already down to half health. Make it a quarter. It's gone. It's a victory for Tactical Feeders. Speed running game number one of this playoffs round. And I love that end call. I feel like all season long, there have been long games where we've just been sitting here talking about, well, they maybe could have ended there. I thought they had a really good opportunity. And it doesn't get much better than that. Two players alive, a full five and a minion wave. They get a great end call and steamroll through that game one. And I know we talked about going into this game, all the roster changes, worrying about chemistry and finding their identity certainly did not have a problem with it last game and that is a dominant win for tactical feeders that was and that was incredible to watch and if you look at their stat line it's everybody played incredibly similar between wards damage structures everything was crazy look at the double adcs almost thirteen thousand fire damage between two of them it's a fantastic showing it's a really tough break for volcanic lightning because almost what could you do in that situation I mean, it, that's such a hard ask to play around what they were facing that time. It was it was tough. Yeah, it was. And I think that last fight kind of encapsulates that victory for Tactical Theaters perfectly. I mean, all their engages, whether it be on towers, whether it be on objectives, the ganks, I mean, the timing was so great. They all waited for Chris Pocket to find that big blink in the back. And then at the same time, everybody rushed forward. And unfortunately for Volcanic Lightning, as soon as they got that Fire Giant, they just did not stand a chance anymore. The objective play and the strategy around the map won that game for the Tactical Feeders. Well, with that, we're going to leave you here at game number one. And going into game number two, the big question is, what can Volcanic Lightning do to slow down Tactical Feeders? We'll be right back on the Smite Draft League with game number two of this playoff round one set. After the story of game number one was gas pedal, gas pedal, and more gas pedal, and nobody even bought Heavenly Agility... What can Volcanic Lightning do to slow things down? I'm Anthony Malum. He's King Fisher. Let's talk picks and bans. Yeah, and I think this is one of the few times in this playoff that going into Game 2 picks and bans, we're not really talking about the draft. I don't think the draft from Volcanic Lightning was too bad. I just think the objective play from Tactical Feeders was on another level, and that's not something that boils down to the god picks. I think that's just play style and confidence on the map. I, yeah, and the deep wards were a big problem. I mean, it it, it almost felt like, or excuse me, it almost felt like tactical feeders knew where everybody was at all times. And that's because they did, because the ward coverage was just out of this world. Yeah, and it's such a nice change of pace to see. I'm used <clears> to seeing so many ganks where you just look in the minimap, like, oh well, yeah, couldn't have done anything about that. They had no idea they were coming. But yeah, the map presence and the map knowledge just all around really good throughout that game. I think they struggled a little bit with their ganks in like the first five minutes, but it got it cleaned up really fast. And it's going to take some adapting on the fly, which we've been talking about a lot through these playoffs from Volcanic Lightning if they want to push it to game number three. Yeah, they've got a lot to get through. I do like the approach they're taking in the picks and bands. With the Hades being gone, that definitely impacted their pressure in the solo lane quite a bit. And then late game, we saw that Hades just do numbers, so. Yeah, it did do really well in the late game. I think uh, full damage Hades is scary, really scary, especially for the backline. That being said, it didn't look like the Hades was getting to the backline too often. I saw a lot of ults on both the Cthulhu and the Atlas. It's kind of just a way of containing them for the double ADC to burst through them. And I can't imagine they go double ADC again, given that they pick a colon. Yeah, I definitely agree. I, The King Arthur and the Horus, it's a combination we haven't seen in a while, but I like that combination a lot. I feel like it's going to lead to a very tanky, strong front line. The Rama selection's also strong. I, These two teams have been drafting so well. Yeah, I'm a big fan of these drafts. I like seeing it get back to classic Smite, Smite that you can tell is going to be competitive. I think the one worry I have for this King Arthur in lane, I think it should do fine against Kakolin. 
But that being said, I think late game, especially given the way the tactical feeder is played that late game, Kakolin is going to have a much bigger impact for his team. The Cthulhu was kind of left on an island a few times, maybe miscommunicating or different players wanting different things. But this Kakolin got down and dirty as Haiti is going to be doing the exact same thing on a much tankier pick. Yeah, I. This is a great start. And. With the Baba Yaga coming out, I want to see a very strong counter to it in mid, and I definitely think that there's options. I mean, we've seen Scylla be very strong. We haven't seen some of the early picks that we've seen this season as much. There's been a lack of Yu Huang. Uh, we haven't seen Agby in a while. I'm kind of curious what's going to get brought out here against it. Yeah, I think Agni, one of those gods that's always kind of in the backseat. You know, it's never quite good enough to get above the rest, and I think we talked about in game one, seeing the plethora of bands given on to the ADC and the jungler each time. Obviously no different in this game. A lot of those top picks, like the Scylla, like the Yu Huang, are being left in the mid lane, so some of those kind of just okay-ish picks really never having their time to shine, and I like seeing the Cupid ban here out of ADC. I think next to Ishar, been one of the most impactful ones lately. Yeah, I think it's been Rom. Ishtar and Cupid just kind of running our SDL version of the meta. From time to time, we've seen Ho Yi be strong. We've seen a few Heim dollars, but and obviously we've seen a few Kernanoses. But I think the the problem child has definitely been Cupid overall. Definitely has, and I do like seeing the CERN ban too. I thought Perspective Duck did really well. Granted, I think late game slipped up a little. Definitely should have been at that tier 2 fight instead of clearing camp. But regardless, stayed at least on level or ahead pretty much the entire game with the Rama. So definitely no qualms about that ban. And the Raven lock-in, I think smart taking it away from Chris Pocket. That last fight in particular looked absolutely unstoppable. And just kind of shaking up the team comps, always a good move. Yeah, I... Robin has been a character that has shown up so strongly in the, what feels like just the last few weeks. We've seen him picked up all season, but in terms of performance, I think the last couple of weeks has really shown out and been a difference maker. And like you said, taking it away from Chris Pocket, I mean, that that blink in the back was ultimately the game-changing decision and, and play from game number one. Yeah, it was. And definitely, Robin, not really a pick I expected to be kind of the premier jungle we've seen so far in round one of these playoffs. I think a lot of other picks, though, I mean, we talk about jungle bans. Let's count up how many. There's four there from the Chaos team and another two. I mean, yeah, six of the ten bans go into one roll. You're going to see some picks like the Robin, who normally aren't at the top, start to really shine through. I would love it if they lock in the Scylla. I think I I love Scylla. I've said that a lot on this desk. Offers so much to the team in every aspect of the game. And combine that with the Humbots, you are setting up for some easy ultimates. Yeah, I, I'm i excited to see these teams. We haven't seen an Artemis in so long either. I don't think we should wait anymore. I don't know about you, Fish, but I'm ready for game number two. So with that, we'll see you in game number two. And we'll be right back on Smite Draft League. Hello and welcome to game number two of Tactical Feeders in blue versus Volcanic Lightning in red. We'll see if the gas pedal continues. I'm Anthony Malum. He's Kingfisher. Let's do it. Yeah, and I, I don't know why on the desk I didn't really process that it was going to be a Horus support. I feel like we haven't seen Horus support in ages. I think Midman has just taken over my mind with the <laughs> Horus jungles. So it's definitely going to be odd to see, but I do like a Horus support in this team comp. I think provides a lot, and especially now with an Artemis. There is going to be a lot of setup for Perspective Duck to get off some nice damage. Yeah, I think this is a great team comp to set up the Artemis. That might actually be what they're banking on, is trying to get that Artemis to late game. Because, I, I mean, Baba Yaga clearly and obviously does a lot of damage. But in terms of having a hyper carry, if nobody gets ahead, they got to really lean on the Artemis. So I expect that to be the priority. 
Yeah, and I definitely wouldn't mind leaning on the Artemis either. I thought Perspective Duck was uh, by far and away one of the best members of Volcanic Lightning during Game 1. So I think setting him up for success, definitely something smart. I'd assume this Artemis has got to at least kind of be a comfort pick. Not normally one of the top ADCs we see. You can definitely still do really good. And the Caledonian board, I think, is one of the greatest ultimates in the game. So you're definitely going to be looking for some big combos with that ult. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be probably their their big game changer. Getting a little low as Patro has to play it a bit safe, but the uh, Colin versus the King Arthur is a classic matchup. Budweiser looks for some aggression, but with the spin to win, he can go right back to lane and take it easy. Q looking for an early gank, but Evan and Nishi spotted out and were plenty safe. Yeah, luckily should be in Patrick finding good damage onto the King Arthur, and this is a lot more even of a fight than I thought it would be. I thought King Arthur would kind of just be bowling out here, but the tier one round shield is definitely giving that uh, Kukulin a little bit of an edge early. I'd be excited to see how aggressive Chris Pocket is going to be this game. We saw on the Ravana a lot of early rotations, a lot of early blinks and, oh gosh, blinking on the name, roots and cripples <laughs> into the enemy team. And it's kind of hard to get that same level of engagement on Hunbots. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I... I mean, we t we t we've really beat the dead horse about that tactical feeders just really had the, the map control was a difference maker. But I I think the only way that they can get around losing out map control, losing out pressure, could be to make some early aggressive plays and simply get kills. I I really think that's the only if you if you can't beat them in map control, if you can't beat them in pressure, you, you got to beat them there, and that's that's I think one of the three ways for volcanic to win this game yeah and it's going to be interesting to see what path they take because i think we talked about a lot in game one it felt really evil even when it wasn't and given that and just how kind of quickly the game seemed to like slip and slide away it's going to be tough for them to identify what exactly they need to change and what has to happen during this game two for them to see the game three and yeah, I don't know where we're going to see that first off, whether it's going to be more ganks, if we're going to see heavier warding, more pressure on objectives. I think only time will tell. I agree. I certainly agree. Very calm start once again, as good news that minion died to sick him. Always got to worry about that last minion. But with the passive start, last time we saw that that passive start led to... The, all, the the big momentum shift in the favor of feeders. They were able to go from the passive start to just taking control. So I wonder if we're going to see more of the same, or if, like I said, Volcanic Lightning will try to turn it around and maybe make some plays to take their own pace into control. Three in mid already, King of Darkness here. Kepri kind of rolling up slightly late, but won't be much of a problem. And yeah, things are just kind of calm all around. Yeah, and I think having the Kepri in tandem with this uh hunbots is actually gonna be pretty good for tactical theaters i think like i already talked about earlier chris bucket he got really involved and hunbots is a lot less safe god from Ravan. but with the scarab's blessing can really get in there and get aggressive go for buff invades ganks whatever it may be caledonian boar finds a good stun this is the arrow so emily kid doesn't have to use anything still has the advantage in range did a lot of damage in response, which is going to cause Perspective Duck to back. We'll have to see if that turns into a purple invade, as there's nobody over on that side of the map. Not a lot of wards, though, to guarantee safety, and there is a deep volcanic lightning ward. So we'll have to see what comes from that. Looks like he's just going to back, and once again, we're back to even Stevens all the way across. Yeah, I'm a, a little bit conflicted there. I would have liked to see a purple invade just to kind of punish that back from Perspective Duck. But I think the, the Horus and the Baba Yaga being at those mid-camps, they definitely could have been over there to contest. So probably doing the safe thing. It's not the flashiest move, but I think we've seen from this tactical team's team, don't you save over flashy anyway. Yeah, they certainly will. It does look like Horus is showing up, but they're going to go for the Scepter, which means it'll be a tough contest for Evan, whom bots making his way over, but nothing they can fully commit to i'd be surprised to see it but it does look like chris pocket's gonna go for it jumps in on perspective duck fear and weevil comes out gets the beads 
King of Darkness ults, but it's just more for safety than anything else as he's out of mana and not much comes with the Fear No Evil. Yeah, not really. I'm, I'm not a big fan of using that Fear No Evil right there specifically. I mean, I do love forcing out the Artemis beads because I think Evan can get that Artemis to ult pretty easily if he just shows some pressure. He's going to be left defenseless in these fights. Having the Fear No Evil on something like the Gold Fury here would be so valuable. We saw last game, Tactical Theaters took the Gold Fury early, and it's pretty much the same game state being dead even so i wouldn't be surprised to see them get aggressive onto those objectives early it'd be really nice to have the totem for that yeah and you know what we haven't talked about in and talking about game number one is the mental for volcanic lightning there it's gonna be very easy they we haven't even addressed it but they didn't get a kill in the first game so it'd be very easy for your mental to kind of get destroyed from that but they've got to be able to pick it up uh, stuck in the trap is Evan, and surprise, surprise, here's Cube and the Robin, but the Rama ultimate comes out at a good time. Could be enough to get away. Going to commit for the kill, but will lead to a death, and there it is. It's a first blood and first kill in this set for Volcanic Lightning. Yeah, and that's the really good kill by Volcanic Lightning. I like the thought of the Rama to try and get the kill, but really smart from Perspective Duck to just kind of run away from that one. Let the Robin finish it up. Rama, no chance of escaping. And there, despite having all those boards set up around the left side of the map, just couldn't back off in time. Yeah, and I was going on a tangent about the mental for Volcanic Lightning and getting the first blood and having that kill over with. It's off their mind. Great for them. Could be huge for Mental. Could be another kill to add on to it. Budweiser commits for it and finds it. Gets the kill. Now the great escape begins. Nishi's here. Chris Pocket's here. Budweiser turns. Gets some damage on Chris Pocket, which was a very smart move because that fought time for King of Darkness to get here. And that gives Budweiser his lane to escape. Normally going in would lead to your death, but that was a really smart maneuver there by Budweiser. Yeah, and there's that patented King Arthur just kind of spin the wing, kill everybody, and don't die. Really good en engage there by Budweiser Cranker. Almost got a second one as well. Would have been huge for the King Arthur. And I think, I mean, mental shouldn't be too much more in question for Volcanic Lightning after those series of kills and really good ones. I think luckily, in game one, they didn't do a whole ton wrong, so hopefully aren't weren't too down and out on themselves. But definitely getting some kills after that first game has to feel good no matter how optimistic you are. Yeah, for sure. And now we see a gank from Cubed onto Patro, keeping the pressure up. It might not result in a kill, but keeping Patro pressured out on that Kakolin could be the difference maker for Volcanic Lightning. Pull in from Nishi on Black Air Forces that requires Baba Yaga to use purification beads. And that's going to be a big advantage for Scylla as Sikkim certainly does not have a uh, <laughs> a cooldown anywhere near Purification Beam. Yeah, definitely not. Not not very close either. So, I mean, even in a few seconds here, are going to be back up. But I think also that King Arthur getting the early lead, even though levels have pulled even. Oh, big abilities expended. Black Air Forces falls at its great coordination from Chris Pocket and Pawa. The Humbats came all the way from behind. Volcanic Lightning Wards not close enough that time. Yeah, and we talked about it. The beads were gone, and it left the door open for Fear No Evil, and they took advantage of it. I'm curious if we're going to see a bit of a play here from either the feeders or the lightning. We saw a lot of early objectives. Hold that thought. Boar from Perspective Duck running it down, looking for the kill on Evan. Came from the side. Not enough damage there to fully commit but aggressive play to get the Rama out of lane regardless. Yeah, good job by the Rama not using beads, not using ult, not panicking. Can be easy when you see that boar, but hangs on him. So should have an advantage against the Artemis, at least kind of fighting when the Artemis gets back to lane. But yeah, I think I was a little surprised that Black Air Forces didn't use the ult when he got ganked by the Hunbots. Because, I mean, obviously CC immunity, damage mitigation. I think looking back at it, though, kind of smart. Because ultimately, Pawa and Chris probably would have gotten that kill. Now, more importantly, Baba has her ultimate for this next team fight, Which should be around an objective pretty soon, I would imagine. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was getting at before the boar incident was that I'm just these two teams were in such a rush especially the feeders and getting us objectives and I'm curious that we'll see more of the same 
Sigma comes out, Crush, good damage, blink from Cube, on to power, Kepri ultimate comes out, so Cube cannot chase it, I'm a monster return, they dash in with the Horus ultimate, they're under tower, looking for the kill on power, and now the Fear and the Weevil comes out, and Cube's gonna fall, King of Darkness teleported them into a death, and that's a tough break for Volcanic Lightning, committing full send for the kill on the power, and being unable to find it, and losing a member in the process. Yeah, I don't... I don't know about that play call. It was certainly ambitious, but luckily they only lose one member because of it. I can kind of see the reasoning though. I mean, getting the Scylla off the map at any point feels really nice, but especially at this phase where we're starting to see players rotate a lot more. The kind of traditional laning phase in mid is kind of ending. So definitely pretty good time to have that Scylla be down. Now two in lane again for Evan. They're going to force this Rama out, but now Humbots might look to get aggressive onto the red buff. Yeah, just to go off what you said really quick, they might have been looking to get power off the map so they could make a play for the Fury. They do steal the red buff successfully, but since power didn't die, now they kind of just find themselves in a spot to reset. That's kind of the main thing I can assume that they went in for. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that was a weird play kind of all around and but it could have gotten worse they did only lose one member as opposed to losing two or more under that tower so ultimately we'll call this a uh we'll call it even <laughs> yeah gonna be called even indeed and i think luckily for tactical theaters even if power did go down that fight they still have a lot of objective pressure having chris Bosch on their team the fear no evil i think i haven't really seen Hanbots use it effectively to zone and secure objectives in a long time. It is an incredibly effective tool. And something else just entered my mind. This is a double book build really early on for the Scylla. This is not a build I'm used to in mid. I kind of like the build. Yeah, I, I think it's going to lead to a lot of early damage. I mean, I do like going poly more so in that fifth slot, maybe fourth. If, if I want to go early, but for how we've seen this fight playing out and how early game one went in the way that the feeders played it, it could, I wouldn't even be surprised if they went it for objective secure or structure damage, honestly. <laughs> they definitely could have and I, I think getting a little bit of sustain into that kit is also really nice especially given that they saw like when they did finally take the fire giant they didn't back for a while they took five towers before they went back to base and then the kit is nice as Budweiser Cranker interrupted Fear no evil in the soul lane Budweiser Cranker getting away Chris Pocket now having to get out of there nice push from Patro but there's just no damage to be found on those two in the soul lane and everybody gets away and it's, we're still at 2 2. Yeah, we are. Patrick was not building into any damage yet. Maybe see it later in the build, but Glad Shield alone really isn't enough to dissuade those players. It's not going to be anything really ventured or game, but getting the Great Scorpion. This is a. I mean, game one was already pretty slow paced. Uh, I guess maybe not slow paced. This is even slower paced. Yeah. 100%. I. <gasps> I thought for a second we might get more, given how quick things were, were going in the start, but it, it slowed down to an even calmer pace than game number one. It almost leaves us with little to talk about. Pyromancer getting pulled and looked at by just King of Darkness, though, so no full commit. I'm definitely surprised we haven't seen more Gold Fury fights at this point, because we're almost to a point of the game where I'd like to see them start pivoting those fights if they haven't done them already because there just has been no attention to it yeah and i think especially for tactical feeders given how gung-ho they were on them in the first game i like their team comp so much more than volcanic lightnings on these objectives that i would really like to see them kind of start getting onto those because last game if you recall it was a lot like this it was really even until a lot of those objectives started falling tactical feeders way that's going to be the go button for them again this game i feel and finally some attention with kepri and hunbots coming over honestly you have a scylla with i'm monster i would just straight up start the gold fury yeah <laughs> I agree, and looks like they're going to get some aggression on a perspective duck. Four comes out, a lot of damage on Evan. Fear no evil. Now the damage goes on perspective duck, but Chris Pocket got stunned, and now he gets trapped, and now he gets killed. Chris Pocket with the 
unluckiest series of events I have seen a Hoombots go through. Big two-man Sikkim, not too much damage from the Crush. I'm a monster used, but there's nobody there for the damage. It does hit Black Air Forces, but doesn't do too much damage. But now there's no I'm a monster for a potential Gold Fury fight, which is not what you want if you're a member of the Tactical Feeders. Crush comes out, which is still good to hear. Gold Fury getting pulled down to half, looking to take advantage of no I'm a monster. Patro setting up with Nishi, Lincoln from Patro. Everybody's healthy. House, 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 doing good damage. Budweiser Cranker around the side. Rama Ultimate in the air finds nobody home and no damage to speak of, but Gold Fury is let go. So ultimately, a nice defense from Tactical Feeders at least being able to stop a Gold Fury attempt. Yeah, I kind of would have liked to see Volcanic Lightning follow that one through. I mean, granted, that was going to be a toss-up. That was... 50-50 at best, but I mean, the Rama wasn't in the skies yet, the Scylla was still dead. It's going to be the most quality chance you have in a decent amount of time to really lock down that objective. That being said, though, that went disastrous for tactical feeders on that gank. Perspective Duck saved that objective for his team and finally it put them ahead. It's only 200 gold, but I think it's their first lead of the series so far. Yeah, and... At, with how game one went and with how the mental needs to be for game two, take every single victory you can get. I mean, we saw how easily Tactical Feeders was able to make the pivot from tier two to Titan in game number one. There's no reason to believe Volcanic Lightning could not do much of the same given the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And opportunities are the key of the game. Who's going to capitalize on them the most? Is a trebuchet in mid going to be dispatched from Tactical Feeders? And now that we're done with that Gold Fury fight, they're starting to, I don't know, kind of pull around the mid lane. Hunbots again can try to get aggressive and loses almost all his health. Prospective Duck is taking everybody on and just kind of winning. Yeah, the Artemis is showing up and it's paying off. It's doing exactly what they needed to do. Pyromancer down the half and only Patro is here. Except here comes power over the wall! Tactical Feeder steals it away with I'm a Monster! Great timing from Power and Nishi getting there at the exact perfect moment. And a wonderful I'm a Monster secures the pyro. And this is where you gotta be careful. Your Volcanic Lightning, that is where a game can start to slip really easily. It draws a gold lead to a little under a thousand. Normally not a problem, but considering the way this game has been going, that is massive. And that's why I wanted them to take that Gold Fury fight. Specifically, so that doesn't happen. Powa finds a massive I'm monster really pulling up in clutch here for his team. Now, tactical feeders, they got pretty good positioning throughout the jungle as volcanic lightning start to group up on the left side. I think this gold fury is going to be looked at pretty soon, too. I think it will, and with the build that that power has gone and being 2 and 0, oh, the, the build is pulling through. And I think now that Scylla has reached the point of being too dangerous to ignore. And the problem with the Scylla being comboed with the Rama is Rama can't be ignored. Then you have Chris Pocket and Patro in your face, making it to where you can't do anything. And Kepri keeps them alive. So tall task here for Volcanic Lightning as we stay even. But with how perspective Duck has been playing and what we know Volcanic Lightning can do in a pinch, I think we've got an exciting end to this game coming up. Definitely do, and it's going to be interesting to see the pacing that Tactical Feeders elect to go with. I mean, uh, uh, the game's been uh, pretty much you flip a coin, and that's who's going to win it. There's been no real discernible advantage. But now with a thousand gold, it's going to be up to them to kind of set the pace of this. They have shown during the set more aggression than Volcanic Lightning. Now grouping four strong, this is going to be the Gold Fury call, I think. Having to dispatch a lot of wards from Volcanic Lightning. No, they're headed back to mid. King Arthur is away. It might be a small opportunity for Volcanic Lightning. Doesn't have that teleport fragment upgraded either, so he's just going to a tower, and there goes the Fury. Yeah, the, the wards were almost a Gold Fury of their own. Blink from Q, outside of the crush. Power taking a lot of damage, has to back away. Gold Fury dropped, still kind of held by Nishi. I'm a monster comes out. Who can it find? There's no opening. Some slight damage on King of Darkness. Not too much damage from the Rama ultimate to speak of, and... Volcanic Lightning stepping back, trying to get away. Cubed is back. Nishi is still here and low. But it looks like they're going to pull the Gold Fury. I mean, Monster is down, so that's a lack of secure. But Crush can be its own secure. Chris Pocket blink brings with him Budweiser Cranker. They let go of Gold Fury. There's the boar bouncing around to everybody. 
Evan doing some good damage in the back. Crush comes out. Now Perspective Duck is too low to commit. Patro got the Kepri ultimate but did not die. So no heal there. Enough to get away. And this Gold Fury stalled out once again. It's really just Power and Evan hanging on. Chris Pocket cannot fight. And Nishi's going to go ahead and back. So after quite the skirmish, there was nothing out of that Gold Fury. Yeah, and this is the time of game last game where they were knocking on the doors to the Phoenixes. Some drastic change from tactical feeders. And I think, again, just like the first Gold Fury fight, I don't like that they dropped that. I think it still would have been toss-up, but still the Scylla Crush at that point. I think going for the Gold Fury first, getting that objective on off the map, and then focusing on the fight or the disengage after might have been the play, and they're going to try it again. Only two members here this time. I don't think there's any scenario where they drop it. They're just going to turn and burn this goal. Agreed. I'm a monster's backup as well. So there's the secure, but it wasn't in time. Volcanic Lightning gets the steal. The Gold Fury, even with I'm a monster up, as they were able to get some burst damage in the last 500 health that made the difference. Yeah, I don't think Powell was really ready for the Gold Fury to fall that fast. I guess a crit from Rama really making a difference. As now they rotate over towards the Fire Giant. And I like seeing them just go from objective to objective. I think it's the right play. But they definitely need to look for a pick here before they can go on to a big objective like that. Agreed. They, there might have been a small opportunity had they had Evan with them. Because the Artemis and the Horus were both a duo. But the opportunity really just did not present itself. Kefri with first steal on the Scorpion, but it was no good. I always respect that. And things are pretty much calm again. A tier 1 tower does fall on left lane. But aside from that, nothing too crazy. We thought for a second we'd see a fire pull, but... Like you said, this wasn't quite there. Yeah, definitely not. They're going to need to do something more than just kind of group up to go for that fire. With all Volcanic Lightning backing, they look like you're going to head towards this fire giant together. Tactical Feeder is heading towards mid. I think Volcanic Lightning are going to see an opportunity here, but I think same boat as Feeders. They need to wait before they do something here, even though they got more pressure on the OBJ right now. I agree. I think there's a chance that they could be getting faded out. Pyromancer getting pulled, and if you, you look, like everybody on feeders is hanging out around the side. There is an I'm a monster, but they let go of Pyro wisely, so I'm a monster finds nobody and no objective, and Pyromancer is easily secured by Volcanic Lightning. Power takes some good damage, and everybody splits off, and it looks like we're about to start our fire giant dances. Yeah, and I like that call from Volcanic Lightning a lot better. They drop it at the right time to avoid the Scylla. I mean, granted, they did kind of kite it into the Scylla, but that's neither here nor there. And now they even this gold lead back up, or I guess, oh, wow, they take a much larger lead since securing that objective. Because now they're 3,000 ahead. It's a really good lead for Volcanic Lightning, but I think it's still not to the point where they can kind of just outright do this fire giant tactical feeders and i think their ultimates in particular have a lot bigger impact than anybody on volcanic lightning yeah i i, I completely agree with you I, I i said it before it might be the start of a fire giant dance but i almost wonder if these teams are a bit beyond that and they might look to make plays beyond the fire giant to try to see what they can open up for themselves as opposed to just dancing around because i think these guys are just a bit smarter than that yeah, definitely are, and I think, I mean, sometimes Fire Giant not even necessary. King of Darkness getting bursted down here, and the forest might be off the map. And King of Darkness falls to Chris Pocket. Rama ultimate up, D good damage to King of, or to be Black Air Forces. Black Air Forces almost one shot by Ama Monster, back by the tower. He's going to have to back, that leaves power open to chase with the team. They are chasing cubed a bit far off to the side. On the other side of the map, it looks like Patro has pushed away perspective cube is gonna fall the question is when the slam brings it home five to three but they chased cubed really far out it's gonna be a tough fire giant but they might just go for it yeah i think it's definitely the right call to go for it i don't think you're gonna find a much better opportunity outside of the deicide especially with their support being gone the king arthur is gonna have to step up to this if any do and that is gonna leave the back lane completely open they're committing fire giant down to a quarter budweiser in the pit perspective there as well tactical feeders manages to secure the fire giant no real fight will continue they will disengage wisely and reset and now they've got five powerful members 
all with Fire Giant. Yeah, and that's a little unfortunate for Volcanic Lightning. I think Bud Weiser played that perfectly on the engage, got in the back lines, took the ROM out of the air, really gave an opportunity to Volcanic Lightning, but unfortunately just not enough burst damage to get it down. And yeah, I mean, Fire Giant onto five members, I think this is going to be the time Tier 1 Towers in all lanes should fall here. They're all pretty low health. Maybe right lane because of how far minions are pushed up is going to be a little harder. Tactical feeders, I would definitely look to push out the lanes and at least get the gold fury off of this FQ. Yeah, I think that's the right call here. We might see them try to bait some fights at the fury because like you said, with the tier ones being up but low, that does kind of give Volcanic Lightning potentially a mental opening where they feel like they have some safety to roam around the map as we do see them five man grouping which I could see Tactical Feeders taking advantage of. Yeah, definitely can and probably should as we see them migrate to the right side of the map. We're just going to let this Primal Fury go. It never really feels good to give up on objective, but it's not an Oni Fury, so I think that's important. Even the Gold Furies too, given that defense buff, can really kind of help to counter out a Fire Giant. But given how late they are in the back, it might be a Tier 2 here for Tactical Feeders. I do like the call to go for tier two, but I think if Volcanic Lightning shows too much face, they should probably back off. It's not worth taking any deaths here over to tier two though. I agree, and Rama's not here. They basically have the reset damage from power, which was significant on the tier two tower. And Budweiser took one step too far. He's one basic away from death, and Patro is the one who finds it. Rama up into the air, finds some damage to King of Darkness after the death to Budweiser. Chris Pocket got poked out. They might be pushing a bit too far, but Budweiser definitely pushed too far and falls down. Yeah, unfortunate for the King Arthur. Got a lot of CC landed on him and tactical feeders. I like that they had Patro, the only one to go up and try and confirm that kill. Confirm it, he did, but nobody else in danger of dying. Now it's going to be a tier one in mid. Honestly, I think they might push the tier two. I like that call, but if they do that, I would just go straight to the tier 1 and left and then call it a day. Gotta be careful about staying out too long, this health and mana are gonna start to dwindle. Gotta watch for the same mistake as last time, you cannot push too far up, they do not do it, they can see the tier 2. And now it looks like Feeder's gonna head to the left lane and clean up the tier 1, maybe take a peek at the tier 2, just as you said. But after what happened to Budweiser, that's the big thing, you cannot make the mistake of being caught out right now. Because we saw in game 1. Feeders will take the advantage if they have it, and they will just end the game out from underneath you. So you cannot be decided right now. Yeah, definitely can't be. Now they're splitting up a little bit. Tactical Feeders, they're still going to go for this tier 2. The Fire Giant buff is almost worn off. I think it has uh, 30 seconds at the maximum. They're going to get this tier 2, and now doing the smart thing, they're going to back off. And with no Gold Fury to go to... They're going to be able to get some buffs back and head straight over to the right side of the map. If I'm Volcanic Lightning, I am beelining it to the Fire Giant. You saw Tactical Feeders go left. It might be the only opportunity that you have to kind of set up some wards and get a little bit of good position. I agree. This is your chance to get some deep wards so that even if they clear what's on the Fire Giant, you can have an idea if they're doing it and try to make some plays around their position. Because if you don't take the opportunity, then it's just going to be gone. We do see the Artemis in left, Baba Yaga mid, and everybody else is kind of split up. So looks like they will not be taking advantage of that. And by the time they peek it out, it, I think feeders will be there in force. Yeah, definitely should be in force. And now we do see Chris Pocket and Patro heading over to the pit. I guess Chris is backing. But the presence of the Kukulin should be enough to dissuade Volcanic Lightning. And it definitely should be. Patro has only fallen once this game, and I think it was pretty early on. And he's building full defense. This Kakolin is tanky. You know, we're talking about tankiness. We're talking about positioning. Pyromancer going to fall, too. Tactical feeders. We are not talking about the damage these ADCs can put out. Perspective Duck and Evan have the potential to kill everybody on either side in less than 15 autos, no matter how tanky you are. So, they've got to all play it safe around that. We've seen Perspective Duck have a nasty Artemis game, but we also know what Evan can do, so. Yeah, definitely going to be a matchup with the two Go ADCs. Both been playing extremely well this game, and it could really be a decider at the end. 
is now. This is where the Fire Giant dance starts, and this is the moment we all love. The Fire Giant dance will it be 10 seconds or 10 minutes. It's got an EFG on the pit, so I think they'll be impatient. Indeed, they will. There goes in game. Getting pulled quick. Down to half. Evan and Power here. Volcanic Lightning is in the pit. Some CC comes on Budweiser. Fear no evil. They've let go of the Fire Giant, but it is low. I'm a monster's up. I'm a monster's used to chase and gets Patro away. Rama ultimate, not enough damage to kill the tanky King of Darkness. And Fire Giant is on tactical feeders, which is a massive step towards a potential victory for them. But Volcanic Lightning only losing one member is not bad. It's not, but to be fair, I mean, Volcanic Lightning kind of gave that Fire Giant up. I don't know why they had two members back right as it was spawning. Maybe counting on the fact that Tactical Feeders wouldn't engage it immediately, but they did. And now they're going to push out these left two lanes of minions, I would assume. And they're going straight for the Phoenix. I don't think they're going to stop at this Gold Fury. Uh, it's spawning now, so they might. Yeah, they may as well on the way, you know. You pass the ABC sword, it's open. You may as well stop and get a little something, something. But they will probably stop at the Gold Fury. No, they're not. They're committing, and I love to see it. Perspective Duck gets deleted by power. No, I'm a monster needed. Just a crush and a sickum was enough to get that kill. That is a massive loss for Volcanic Lightning. It's now a 4v5 to defend. That is a truly disgusting amount of damage. The Artemis couldn't even pop the Aegis, and that is why you ban Scylla. All teams going forward, ban Scylla. He's too strong. Splitting mid left is Tactical Feeders, looking for the Phoenixes, Volcanic Lightning, trying to see if they can make any kind of opening. House comes out, doing okay damage, but Patro is in the thick of it and stalling well. I'm a monster, back again, comes out, Rama up into the air, doing good damage on King of Darkness. I'm a monster, used, but does not hit. That's gone, and that's a massive ultimate gone. Power gonna take the long way around and take his time getting back to the fight. Deep in is Patro. Phoenix gonna fall. That's two Phoenixes down. Patro gets the two-man knockoff. Fear no evil finds two, make it three. No kills. Power uses a Sentinel to get in. No kills yet. They're gonna head to the right Phoenix. They're cleaning a house before they go for the end. But this has given time for Perspective Duck to respawn. So that's gonna be huge, and that's enough for the feeders to think twice about going for the end. Yeah, and I like that call clearing all three Phoenixes because, I mean, Fire Giant has about, I would think, another two minutes on it. They took it at, like, the 31-minute mark. So, I mean, you can literally back buy items. Even if Fire Giant wears off, you have no Phoenixes to contend with. They're giving themselves a lot of freedom, and there goes Patra on the engage. They don't want to back. They want to end the game now. Patra thought he had a pick on Perspective Duck, and that could be the pick that could win on the game. So he went in deep, but it wasn't quite there. Now Tactical Feeders has reset. They're at the Phoenix door, but there's no Phoenixes, so they could kind of choose to go in when they want to. Looks like they're going to ping out the waves and wait to join the three fire waves, which is smart because that's just a lot of pressure for a team to contend with. But I stand by what I said. Perspective Duck could be a difference maker in this fight now that he's up. And Tactical Feeders needs to make this perfect. They really got to work around those waves. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a tricky situation because even though they are so far in the lead, one misstep could mean Volcanic Lightning goes screaming down the other lane. They see Robin and left, and that is their go button. They walk into the Titan room. Can they burst it? Tusky came out, power dropping low. He has Capri Ult on him. I'm a monster is good, and Capri Ultimate reset it. Power still alive. Perspective Duck doing numbers, but not as much numbers as Evan. Perspective Duck has a kill, so does Evan. Chris Pocket. Dropping low, Perspective Duck is full health in here. Evan is also full health. King of Darkness stunned out, they can't find the kill. Tactical Feeders has been pushed out, but they still have four members and they have the Fire Giant healing for a little bit longer. Perspective Duck gets caught out. That could do it, but he kills Chris Pocket on the way out. Evan finds the kill on Duck. Evan's got a double. Getting killed, King of Darkness. And he's one basic. He's going to find it! Evan gets a triple kill! And that triple kill secures Tactical Feeder's spot in the semifinals! The play coming out from both ADCs on that Phoenix fight was absolutely incredible. Credit to Perspective Duck for trying to keep their team in it. But Evan cleans up and cleans house.
Tactical Feeders take it 2-0, and that was a really, really good late game push from the chaos, or order side team. Uh, yeah, I agree. I Perspective Duck gave it everything in that last defense, and the player damage speaks volumes of how effective it was, and it was close, but ultimately, Tactical Feeders was just a machine in that set, and they were just unstoppable. It felt like there there was so many strengths and so many good calls. It's it's very difficult to point out one particular thing they did. Yeah, definitely hard to. And both teams played so well, but obviously, with tactical feeders moving on, they're gonna go up against the City Boys team that looks really really good in their win, and I think consistently all season have been showing up big. Do you think they need to change anything up here in their approach to their semifinals matchup, or do you just kind of go with what works? I think you go with what works. You tighten things up, and clearly, they know the characters that work. They know the strengths. They know how to play as a team. So probably the biggest thing to focus on is preparing for your opponent. You get to know who you're facing, and if you counterpick them, if you counter ban them, if you play around your strengths and make it the priority, if you go comfort over meta while simultaneously keeping your opponent's strengths in mind, I think Tactical Feeders has a nice, clean route to the finals. City Boys will put up a fight, and they have just as good of a chance, but that was too impressive from Tactical Feeders to ignore. It definitely was, and I think the one aspect of their game that was admittedly a little weak may have been the early game. I don't necessarily think they did bad, but especially going up against a team like City Boys, you need to have a strong, polished early game to transition into the late. And credit to Volcanic Lightning, they put up a hell of a fight despite the 2-0. Despite the low kill counts, that was an incredible fight from the Volcanic Lightning. It was, and with that, after an exciting end to the set, we're going to leave you here, and with that, that's a wrap-up on round one of the SDL playoffs for the Challenger Division. Next time you see us, it'll be time for the semi-finals on the way to the grand prize pool for the winner. I've been Anthony Mellum, I had Kingfisher with me, we had Nublet on production, and we will see you in the semi-finals.